COVID-19, the global economy is at a standstill. Markets are in turmoil. The S&P 500 opening lower by more than 8%, of course, that greater than the 7% level that triggers the level one circuit breaker. Retail sales down. Oh my God, look at this. All right, retail sales year to date minus Oof. 20%. Unemployment up. 4.4 million people filing for initial jobless claims uh, last week. Even if ultimately temporary, it will have a significant impact on economic activity. Some economies are opening up. To preserve the health of our citizens, we must also preserve the health and functioning of our economy. Despite warnings, opening up too early could have consequences. Ultimately, the virus is going to determine when we really can safely reopen. In this time of crisis, how can investors navigate volatility and uncertainty? We convene the biggest names across finance, economics, and investing to help investors weather the turbulence. We are live in Hong Kong, Dubai, London, and New York for exclusive interviews and smart analysis. This is Bloomberg Invest Global. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good morning. If you're here in North America, I'm Eric Schatzker, editor at large at Bloomberg. On behalf of Bloomberg, I'd like to welcome you to day three of this special virtual series, Invest Global. We are live across several regions, of course, Asia, the Middle East, Africa, Europe, and the Americas. We're speaking with many of the most influential names in finance, investing, and economics, all to help you make sense of the extreme volatility we have been seeing in global markets. And to understand, of course, what the near and far-term opportunities and risks will be as the world tries to emerge from the unprecedented shutdown brought on by the coronavirus crisis. I wanna start my remarks by thanking CMC Markets, our European sponsor for helping make possible this global event. Uh, you can check out more about CMC Markets in the resources section of our event platform. And before we begin the program, I wanna share with you a few housekeeping notes. Make sure you are using one of two browsers, either Firefox or Chrome, to view these sessions. If you're having trouble with audio or video quality, please refresh your browser. You can restore windows using the buttons at the bottom of your screen, and the size of each window is adjustable. This is an interactive event, and of course, we welcome your questions. To submit one, please type it into the Q&A box below the slide window and click Submit. Please include your first name and the city where you happen to be when you're asking a question. We're also going to be taking live polls. You'll see the question pop up on your screen as I'm talking. And when that happens, I want you to take a moment to uh, register your responses. Please also engage with us on Twitter using the hashtag Bloomberg Invest. And without further ado, folks, I would like to welcome our first guest. He is Luke Ellis, the CEO of Man Group. Luke, are you there? There you are. I Good. see you. Uh, I you am here. Me, it Hopefully this will work. I, I can hear you fine. Uh, I think this is going to work. So, Luke, um, good, good, good. That's a little bit of a delay. We'll, we'll, we'll manage. I, I'm, I'm going to begin with a poll question, Luke, before we get into our conversation. Poll question should be uh, popping up on your screen, folks. The question is this. Will equity markets get more volatile in the fourth quarter? Yes, the storm is far from over. That is your first choice. Uh, second choice, some but not as severe as earlier this year. Your third choice, very little markets have priced in most scenarios. So nobody has a sanguine outlook. Uh, I can see here that uh, close to 40% of our respondents think, you know, more bad weather is on the way, and about half think it's going to be stormy, but not quite as bad as it was back in March. So, Luke, uh, let's begin here. As our audience knows all too well, any number of fascinating developments have played out in financial markets over the course of this pandemic. 
But the one thing no one seems to have predicted or anticipated is the revival of the day trading phenomenon and the ascendancy of Dave Portnoy as the Pied Piper of the COVID-19 trade. What I would like to know from you, Luke, is this something Man Group is following? Are you trying to measure its impact on prices and what have you seen? Well, we've certainly seen a remarkable pickup in retail trading, particularly in the US and or predominantly in the US. And uh, we've certainly been monitoring how much of activity is coming from retail. And what you've seen is it definitely, you know, the, the first rebound off the bottom of the lows in March, that was a classic sort of recovery off a, off a big dip that you get. And then the fact that the rebound has come all the way back to where where we are going higher is, is seems to really have been driven by this retail buying. And it came as soon as the first of all, when the NBA was cancelled, then when the six six hundred dollar check started clearing, suddenly you saw a lot of retail activity. And it's been tough for us in the first few weeks of that activity because it's a new player in the market that we haven't seen for maybe 10 years and it's a significant player and so some stocks have been behaving in ways that don't look like patterns we've seen in the past but what we think is you know the models and and our trading is rapidly evolving to understand what's going on and then we're able to make money out of those players as they go forward okay talk to me a little bit about that because that's intriguing making money from these players how is it that man group has figured out how to take the day trading phenomenon and turn that into a profitable strategy well the first level of it was things we don't do which is really the the very high frequency trading we, we don't do that and you could see from publicly declared numbers from people like virtue that's a listed company that there's been Luke, I'm not sure if you can hear me, but we seem to be having some some technical trouble. Um, cool. Well, we sort the other technical problem out. Hopefully, I think that's a good call. Uh, these are this things becoming that, uh, increasingly familiar with. Everyone knows. Familiar with. Everyone knows how difficult it is to uh, to make some of these virtual events happen. So I was asking you how it was that men were able to develop trading strategies to profit from uh, the, re the day trading phenomenon. And you were, why don't you, why don't you rewind why don't you and go rewind back to the point you were making? Go back to the point you were making there. Sure. So, so, so the first people to benefit were the high frequency traders to provide, provide liquidity. liquidity. At the end of 2017, we decided to take a hard look at the actual numbers, both in terms of our representation and our stories, but also on our TV programming and our radio programming. And the numbers really surprised us. About 10% of our outside guests that were brought onto TV were women. I think we all can agree that the industry would be far better off for being more diverse. What we heard from the bookers was that either they said that they couldn't find the women, there weren't women in the right roles that they were looking for, or if they found the woman, the woman didn't feel comfortable going on TV. And we thought the one thing that we could actually impact was this issue of the training. And we created an initiative called New Voices in 2018 to offer four-hour one-on-one training for each woman that we brought in to give them some video experience, some feedback, to learn about their messaging. This is what I would say. I think quarterly earnings, we all get extremely focused on. You know, it's a really good training. And what I really learn is just understanding sometimes you may not want to answer that question and just being able to pivot to something else entirely and getting your point across. Something that really impressed me about this initiative is that it is without any expectation and the program is fully confidential. It's not necessary to go on Bloomberg TV after this. The idea is that you will be TV ready to voice your opinions, to share your perspective.
the ultimate goal from a journalistic standpoint is that we have better programming, that we have more interesting conversations at events, and hearing opinions that we may not otherwise have voiced. The only way to really achieve those goals is to have that representation uh, within the financial news. So we've more than doubled the percentage of women experts on our TV and radio to over 21%. Why do you think tech executives are putting their money and their muscle behind this now? I see the difference when we have more female voices on our show. There are new ideas, new insights. Anyone really who's looking to grow professionally in their career is a fantastic opportunity to take up. Luke Katerik, have I got you back? Yeah, I'm Luke Katerik, have I got you back? Excellent. All right. Well, um, I'll remind everyone that the most excellent. All right. The, well, the only um, thing more important I'll than having a plan is having a backup plan. The only thing more important than having a plan is having a backup plan. This is our backup plan. So, once again, if you don't mind, so, uh, once I'll ask again, you the question again so that I can mind, remind everyone what uh, we were talking about. I'll we ask you the question again so that I can remind everyone what we were talking about. We were talking about the day trading phenomenon that has emerged you know, in the sort of weeks March since meltdown, the, as it were, and you know, sort of March meltdown, as it were, man group has been able to develop you are explaining how it is that man group has been able to develop strategies that are profiting from the retail flow and the pricing signals that you have uh, been able to Hello, my name is Matthew Bloxham. I'm the lead for technology, media and telecom research for Bloomberg Intelligence for the EMEA region. Now, work from home has clearly exploded um, through the pandemic lockdowns, uh, but really the opportunity for technology companies depends on where it settles as restrictions ease. Uh, and to understand that potential, um, we've looked at some data um, that's made available by Eurostat, which is the Statistics Bureau of the European Commission. Uh, and what you can see in this chart um, is the proportion of the workforce that historically has worked from home uh, and the kind of opportunity set as we see it for where that could go uh, in the longer term. And essentially we see that potentially work from home uh, could double from its historic levels going forward. Now what you can see that the, the blue bars show you the percentage of the labour force in Europe uh, that historically has been working from home. The dark blue bars represent people that work from home or that their home is their usual place of work and the light blue bars uh, represents the, um, the labour force um, who occasionally work from home. Uh, now together that adds up to about 16% uh, of the total European workforce, about 5% usually work from home, another 11% occasionally work from home. Now the yellow markers represent what we see uh, as the opportunity set uh, for work from home going forward and that essentially represents the proportion of the labour force uh, that works in service industries that we see as um, kind of conducive to working from home. Uh, and what we see for Europe as a whole is that that opportunity set could be 30% of the labour force, so roughly double the historic average, but that the spread is quite different across European countries. You can see on the left-hand side of this chart that countries like Sweden and the Netherlands uh, are already operating at a level that's quite close to that kind of maximum opportunity set. But then you see countries like Norway, which is about two thirds of the way to the right, where current uh, historic levels of work from home are a long way below the opportunity set. Um, so, and actually what's quite interesting is that for the big European markets, so the UK, Germany, France, uh, Italy and Spain, there's also quite a substantial upside potential there if working practices do shift um, as lockdowns ease. And that could be a great opportunity for technology companies in the region. Now, how close we get to that maximum potential depends very much uh, on how uh, employers shift their work from home policies. 
we've seen that Twitter um, and Facebook have taken the lead globally in, in how they're offering their staff the opportunity to work from home permanently. But we have started to see similar moves from big European companies. For example, Barclays and WPP, the ad agency, their CEOs have both acknowledged that there's going to be a permanent shift in how people work going forward. Uh, and we've seen Telenor, the Norwegian telecom carrier, offer its uh, employees opportunities to permanently work from home going forward. So the shifts are happening. So we will definitely, I think, see uh, that historic average of kind of 16% 16 or so go up. Uh, and it could quite easily get into the 20 to 30% range, which creates quite a substantial opportunity for technology companies in Europe. So the digital transformation opportunities for the technology sector in Europe um, really enabled by work from home uh, but that kind of work from home opportunity is only really enabled um, if home broadband connections are working well. Now there were definitely con some concerns in Europe um, when lockdowns first kicked in that the networks might not be able to cope with the additional demands of being made of them uh, and we saw moves for example to ask Netflix and other streaming platforms to cut uh, their streaming throughput by about 25% to help protect networks so people could work from home effectively. Uh, and I think since then, actually, there's been very few incidents uh, of network problems reported across the region. Uh, but we thought it'd be interesting to kind of dig a little bit deeper and see what the home broadband experience has been for people at an individual level. And to do that, uh, we carried out a survey of London-based staff of Bloomberg, um, who are typically quite intensive users of home broadband connections to see how their experience had been. And the results of that survey were quite interesting. Now, about 575 people took part in the survey um, and we found that overall 80% uh, of respondents were either somewhat or very satisfied with how their home broadband connection had performed during lockdown in the UK. And that's despite the fact that 62% of those respondents said they'd experienced some issues uh, with their connection during lockdown. Now those issues were typically either slow speeds um, or unstable connections, but overall they weren't kind of substantial enough to kind of detract from people's uh, perception uh, of the experience they were getting. But you know, we did see that there's a kind of um, a significant minority of people who've been frustrated enough by the home broadband experience to consider switching uh, provider. About 26% of the respondents said that they were either considering or planning to switch provider as a result of their home broadband experience in lockdown. And we found that typically people were more inclined to think about switching if they had a slow broadband connection. So typically a connection that was below 20 megabytes gigabits per second. Uh, we also saw, I think, linked to that, that about 28% of respondents said that they were planning to upgrade the speed of the connection they had, either with their current or a new provider. Um, so that's kind of encouraging, I think, for the sales opportunity within the telecom industry. Uh, what was quite interesting, too, uh, was that Hyperoptic, which is a niche full fibre only provider in the UK had by far and away the most satisfied users within our survey and again I think that's kind of reassuring and kind of underpins uh, this shift towards full fibre we're seeing so I think overall for the industry it's quite reassuring for telecom carriers who are investing billions of dollars as we speak in these new expensive full fibre networks that there's definitely as a result of the lockdown experience, um, a growing shift towards upgrading to faster connections, which are more expensive, so will generate more revenue for the industry, and that will in turn help to pay and accelerate the payback uh, on these expensive new networks that are going into the ground across Europe as we speak. So I hope that's been an interesting insight into the work we've been doing here in, in London. Um, you can contact me, Matthew Bloxham, via the terminal, and you can find out more about our research at BI Go. Thank you. How appropriate that we should be sharing with you the results of a broadband lockdown satisfaction survey.
Welcome back, everyone. I'm Eric Schatzker, editor-at-large here at Bloomberg. Uh, those of you who have been with us know that we've been wrestling with a few technical difficulties. I know you'll understand and give us some latitude. These are challenging times. It is a pandemic, after all, and, and many of us are surviving by Zoom, Teams, WebEx, whatever platform you happen to prefer. We're going to make the best of this one. Luke Ellis, the CEO of Man Group, is my guest. Luke, thank you very much for your patience. Uh, people, people, regrettably, people can't see us live, but they can hear us live. And so I think it would be appropriate, uh, because we had been interrupted by the back and forth of the video, to rewind and go back to the beginning of our conversation at the risk of sounding a little repetitive. I think it's appropriate, particularly for those who are now just joining us. Um, Man Group, for those who don't know, is one of the world's premier quantitative investing firms. And, um, and because of your expertise in systematic strategies, but furthermore, what powers those systematic strategies, the analysis, the gathering and analysis of pricing data, I wanted to talk to you about one of the more fascinating developments in markets over the past few months, and that is the rise of the day trading phenomenon uh, typified by... Uh, Davey Day Trader Global, uh, otherwise uh, known by his real name, Dave Portnoy of Barstool Sports. Luke, is this day trading phenomenon something that Man Group is trying to wrap its arms around, measure, understand, and, and perhaps profit from? Uh, it's certainly something that we're trying to wrap our arms around and understand what was going on, and then what we're trying to do is to understand its impact on market prices and patterns in markets, and to make sure that our models adapt for that. It's not that we are per se trying to make money out of the day traders, and we don't actually do anything that's sort of very high frequency, so we're not in and out within a day in the stuff we do. We leave that to the Berties and Citadels of the world. Um, but you know, whenever you get a new actor come into a market, they tend to change the market behavior. They tend to change some of the market price patterns. And normally what happens, the first phase is difficult for the models because they are having, it takes them a while to realize there's a new participant in the market. But then gradually they will start to identify what's changing and then we'll, t we'll try to take advantage of the new patterns, the new way markets are trading with the new participants. It's a bit like, you know, if you're playing a game of poker and a new player comes to the table, um, you know, you don't understand that player's tells, you don't understand the way they choose to bet or not bet. And so it's quite hard as a professional to trade, to play poker against somebody that you haven't seen before. But the longer that you play with them, the more you can adapt your style of playing to try to take advantage of the opportunities that it creates. I'm going to run with your poker analogy. Thus far, it appears that uh, this new cohort, the day trading community, has taken a few hands uh, from the pros at the table. Is that something that can continue, or are participants like yourselves going to figure out what the patterns are, and, and eventually these, these, you know, new occupants of the seats at the table are going to lose their whatever advantage they may have, uh, you know, because their, their, their trading is, is, is less predictable than, than, uh, you know, others might be. I think over time, over time, we would all expect that valuations do matter. That doesn't mean value is the only thing that can work, but valuations do matter. Relative price performance matters. The amount something's overbought or oversold matters, so on and so forth. And so the, um, you know, over time, uh, alpha harvesters, which is a way of thinking of what we do, you know, our job is to generate alpha for our clients. And, uh, you know, the more inefficient actors there are in a market, the more opportunity there is for generating alpha. So, you know, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, this day trading phenomena really came in at a, at a perfect moment. They came in at a place where the professional community was you know, very keen to fade the bounce in the market. And 
the, the sort of day trading community took the market up and took a number of the darlings of the market up a long way. And, you know, that's been a difficult environment for a lot of professionals. But uh, bit by bit, I think you're seeing um, some of the more, you know, more, of, more of the natural realism coming in and more of the opportunity to, to trade things in a, you know, for, for people like us, for models like ours to adapt to take advantage of what's happening in the current market. Luke, if you look back over the past three and a half months and analyze performance uh, since, say, you know, the first week of March when things really began to change in markets, who's fared better, man or machine? I never think of it as one or the other. I, you know, the, the, the reality is there are no humans investing in the market without using machines today, whether it's because that's how they get their information via Bloomberg, whether it's the way they study their portfolio, whether, you, you know, now in Bloomberg you can get so much information about a stock. So, so you know, humans are, are, are armed by machines in the same way in our quantitative business. You know, it's humans that are building the models that are then running on the machines. So, you know, I don't think it's one against the other. I think what you saw... If, if, if you wanted a general sort of characterization, I think that directional strategies uh, had a better time of the first half of the crisis um, and relative value type of strategies had a pretty tough time because you know, it, it, first you had the big sell-off and then you had the recovery in things which you know, the question of whether they got government money or didn't get government money is you know, outside the scope of normal valuations. Um, but I think over time, the people that have done best are the ones who were able to remain calm and continue following a structured process. Machines are good at that. But there are plenty of people in the, the machine, the quant world, who have got the wrong side of these trades. Interesting that you should make that observation. Uh, we have a chart that we prepared ahead of time that does show how well CTAs, you know, which we might call trend-following strategies, did relative to the broader stock market in the initial phase of the crisis and then uh, haven't done so well as of late. Um, trend-following is a, a strategy in some respects based on factors and or at least it falls into the same camp. And Luke, there have, if I'm not mistaken, there have been at least two major factor rotations since February, one toward the beginning of April and one again toward the beginning of June. And it raises a question for, for many whether there's a new volatility regime in factor land. Is there? So, so I think we would say by historical standards, there might have been 15 factor rotations in the course of the month. <laughs> um, and so you've definitely seen a significant increase in volatility of relative performance of factors. And I think that has been something that has been building for a while and has been really exacerbated in the last few months. And it's basically you know, when people first started factor investing, it was very much an alpha source. It was a differentiation source. If you end up with a place where everybody is factor investing, then it becomes purely a risk factor. And what you've seen over the last few years is significant increases in the amount of factor investing such that a lot of factor investing is now really a risk factor. And once it becomes a risk factor, it, it, it's then you tend to get these rapid changes in relative performance in the factors and you tend to you, you have to manage the you have to manage it as a risk rather than creating as a, as a you know treating it as an opportunity. What are the consequences of that? The, the is there anything I suppose uh, the better question might be are there any consequences to that beyond more volatility? Well, well, I think one of the things of it is you have to avoid thinking that, you know, the moves that we saw beginning of June, you know, there was a, a big spike for value and then it, 
it was all given back incredibly rapidly to momentum. You know, one has to stop thinking of those as the signs of big changes in market environment and to recognize that they're much more likely technical features within the market. Um, you know, I, sort of everybody wants value to, well, maybe not everybody, the growth managers don't, but the, the sort of, you know, there's a general conversation you hear around investing all the time about must be finally time for value to come back. I think that, you know, we're likely to see a lot of false dawn given the amount of money that will switch from a momentum index to a value index then back to a momentum index. So we're likely to see a lot of false dawns. And personally, I don't think you get a significant change in value until we see a change in the interest rate regime and the inflation regime. And yeah, that doesn't feel like it's happening anytime soon. Don't tell Cliff Astas. Um, <laughs> Luke, if in fact you're right and factors have evolved beyond alpha generation tools and portfolio attribution tools and become in and of themselves risk management tools, does that mean that they are thoroughly commoditized and you can't actually use factors as an alpha tool any longer? I think that you know, the, the, the simple version of the factors has definitely become commoditized. And you can use it as a portfolio construction tool in a form of diversification, which is a risk management thing. But I think, you know, we, we are strong believers that, you know, the world gets more efficient every day. Information becomes more available every day. There's more information on Bloomberg and you can download every, every day. And what that means is that the, there is a natural decay in the power of any historic alpha source. And what's important in order to keep generating alpha on a forward-looking basis is you need to keep creating, you need to keep innovating, you need to be finding new things which are not over time priced in. So I'm sure that there will at some point be a rally in value. And some people will say, look, I told you so all the time, but you have to look at it in what the risk adjusted return was over time. And, you know, I think a lot of it now would be noise. So, you know, we think you have to move to a much more sophisticated level of understanding cross-sectional value within sectors and then neutralizing for other effects within there and looking at each stage for, okay, Here's what's in the price. What are the things that the, the average investor is not looking at? What is it that is different rather than just because I want something to go up or down? That reminds me of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the term, if you will, that people throw at quantitative investing, which is to say arms race. You know, he who has the, the most data and the fastest computers wins. Um, with what you just said, Luke, as, as the context, what do you believe is worth the expense of time and money today to differentiate what man is doing from your competition, if you will, to gain an edge? I think everything in the technology sphere is an arms race. Um, you know, we can see that in the data provision business where there's a very small number of super successful businesses. You could see it in the, the uh, social media space and you could see it in you know, gradually happening in quant investing. I think the thing that you missed when you talked about that is, you know, that, that buying bigger and bigger compute power is, that's, that's easy and that there's no real barrier to entry there. Getting more data, there's really not that much of a barrier to entry anymore there because the data is incredibly freely available. I, Sort of not an hour in the day doesn't go by without some data provider contacting me saying they've got a new WYSI data set. The scarce resource is people who can understand how to program those computers, who can understand how to model and do the math in a both sophisticated and also an intellectually honest way. Yeah, intellectual honesty, recognizing really what is alpha and what is likely noise, not data mining. You know, with all of these data sets, 
the temptation to over data mine is incredible. And so, you know, we think that the scarce resource which you need to hoard to use sort of traditional metrics about it is the intelligence, is the experience, is the, uh, the quants and the technologists. And so, you know, we're at a point today where half the firm is using Python every day in anger. It's a coding language, but it just gives a sense of how much of the firm is really, uh, how much of what we're investing in is into the intellectual firepower, which enables you to be successful in doing quantitative things. As you know, Luke, some big hedge funds generated exceptional returns in March, in April, and even in May, and, and that may even be continuing, although I haven't seen June numbers yet because the month isn't over. Many of those hedge funds are not systematic players, they're discretionary players. Does that in any way validate the discretionary hedge fund as an investment vehicle, um, or does it say something else? Look, I, I think that there have always been and there will always be exceptional discretionary fund managers. You know, a third of what we do at MAD is discretionary fund management, and, you know, we've had some very good returns out of this. Um, you know, it, it seems to me one of the things is with, you know, so. So it's fantastic, and you know some of the people who've done brilliantly are friends, and I'm, I'm delighted for them. And I and you know I think their success is great. It doesn't doesn't mean everybody can be a discretionary fund manager or discretionary hedge fund manager and be successful. You know it's the it's only the very exceptional ones that can generate the significant returns and can remain calm as everything is going crazy around them in order to see the patterns that are there that they're trying to take advantage of. You know, their process, that there's nobody who really does any of this stuff purely by gut feel. Their gut feel is a series of processes and rules that they've developed over time, which are going on in the back of their head all the time to then take advantage. So I, I'm a believer in discretionary hedge funds. Um, you know, and I think actually the overall hedge fund business, you know, 2008, the hedge fund business did a pretty poor job on average, uh, this time around, the hedge fund business has done a pretty decent job and has you know, delivered the diversifying returns that clients want. And you know, I think on average, it's, it's been a pretty decent outcome now. Luke, after the last crisis, the financial crisis, of course, in 2008, 2009, there was regulation, lots of it, in fact, and mostly it was uh, regulation of the banking industry. What I'd like to know from you is what, if any, regulatory response do you see coming out of this crisis? So I think the big driver for regulatory response is governments, regulators, central banks hate losing control. And when you look at the financial crisis, you know, the governments and the regulators and the central banks lost control and they just had to throw money at the problem that was created by the banks. Then out of that came limits on leverage. Out of that came uh, stress testing that basically meant that banks had to run with a more conservative business in many different ways. And out of it came some personal liability for the people running banks uh, for what went on. And what's happened this time is the banks have been a source of stability in all of this. And you know, you would say that the more conservative balance sheets and the more conservative business models that they run today that has augured well through this crisis. What we've seen is that in the next, in the ten years since the last crisis, an awful lot of the corporate community has moved to maximum leverage that they can possibly get onto their balance sheet. So maximum financial leverage, but also maximum maximum operational gearing and minimum resilience. And so, you know, you can say that the, that the shock came out of left field, but the reality was we saw a large number of companies, both public and private, that couldn't withstand even a one month shock to their, uh, to, to their business and certainly not a three month shock to their business. And so governments and central banks have been forced to throw enormous amounts of money at the problem. 
I think coming out of this, and obviously in the US, there's a question of the election and politics, but generally coming out of this, I think you're going to see either driven by shareholders or more likely driven by regulation, that there will be limits on the amount of leverage that companies can run, financial leverage. Uh, there'll be a drive to some form of stress testing of businesses to make sure that they have less operational gearing so that they're able to withstand things. You, know, you can think of, you know, we move to a just-in-time manufacturing world, which starts as a good idea, reducing inventories, but got to a place where you had major manufacturers who had one hour of spare parts and supplies in order to do their manufacturing, which meant they couldn't withstand any sort of shock at all. Um, you know, I think coming out of this, it's likely that companies are going to either of their own choice or be forced to run with you know, similar type of stress tests that banks have, but not just around financial constraints. And so to me, you know, I understand, you know, you've had a number of very smart people, including my old friend Manny, on this series of talks talking about how the economy, you know, the sort of GDP could be back to 2019 levels by the end of 2021. I think that's very credible. But I think the question of what you will get in terms of net earnings through to shareholders, I think it's very hard to see that that will be back to the same levels that we were before. Because even if revenue gets back to the same level, the reality is there is going to be a force to having a higher cost. You're going to have to have, to have more capital, so it's a higher cost of capital, less return for shareholders. I think you're going to have to run with more inventory, more of that sort of thing. And you know, I think there is going to be a drive to paying more to uh, critical workers, low-end workers. We've all discovered that the Amazon delivery driver is critical to our survival. Um, and so out of all of that, what's left for shareholders out of the same earning stream just doesn't look like it can be as much to me as we, as we come out the other side of this event. There's a natural tension, of course, Luke, between profits and you know, costs, if you will. The, what I'm trying to get at is the public was ready to accept regulation of Wall Street because Wall Street had done so much you know, to anger the public and to anger politicians. In this case, the anger you describe is certainly felt at the central bank level. It might even be felt at uh, the governing level. But do you think the public is willing to tolerate the kind of regulation you describe if it's going to result in fewer jobs? Because companies are going to have to make that well, decision I, between I'm, profits and jobs. I'm not sure that it results in fewer jobs. So I think that, you know, look, it, the reality is the public an anger wasn't directed at the banks until we were coming out of the crisis. And right now we're right in the middle of the crisis and people are mm -hmm. focused on survival in the end. But, you know, I think the idea that, you know, we have taken Friedman's idea of primacy of shareholders to an extreme level. And we basically, you can pick all sorts of companies, and I'll try and avoid choosing an individual name, but where they ran their business in such a geared fashion that at the first sign of trouble, a mixture of governments have been forced to throw a lot of money at them, and they've laid off an enormous number of workers, or they would have laid them off if it wasn't for government supporting them and paying for them in the meantime. You know, I think that you're going to see governments refusing to write that free put to shareholders in the future, um, and they're going to charge them for the put. And I think at the same time, you're going to find that you know, companies that look after their employees and don't go to minimum standards are going to find it much easier to get and hold on to the high quality employees that they want. And actually, you know, we've all talked about ESG a lot in the last few years. It's share clients and therefore shareholders talk about ESG a lot. I think most of the energy has been focused on the E part of that and trying to help the environment. Yeah, but the social elements are really important and 
you know, I don't think there's anything at odds with having a long-term successful business which looks after its employees and doesn't sit there going, well, I need to fire a load of people to maximize my one quarter earnings. I don't have to do a buyback in order to boost the shares for a few months that actually I can think about running the company with a five and a 10 year view. And in that process, you will hang on to certain, uh, you know, more employees. You will want to provide better conditions to your employees because actually in the long run, it is more effective and you end up with a more valuable business over time. I might call that, Luke, an inspiring idea, and I hope uh, others are listening. Luke, I want to thank you very much for joining us here at Invest Global. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is Luke Ellis. He is the CEO of Man Group. Luke, thanks again, and thank you for your patience. Uh, and without thanks further ado, I'd like to ha hand the baton off to my colleague, Jason Kelly, who will be bringing you our next guest here at Invest Global. Jason? Eric, thank you so much. Uh, nice to be with you virtually. Eric and I got to catch up in the office yesterday very briefly in New York City, and it was a cool thing. I wish I was in the same room, though, with Bruce Flatt, the CEO of Brookfield. He's in London. I'm at my house in New York. We're making it all work. Bruce, you and I have talked a lot about this strange world that we're living in. I'm so excited to get your perspective on where we are and where we're going when it comes to the world and the world of real estate. First of all, how are you? What, what's it like in London? What's it like for your employees across the world? Good to be on, Jason. Thanks for having me. And, you know, I would just say that, uh, the, you know, leave aside the, the health um, impact of everything. Um, the only thing uh, constant in life is change. And uh, we've witnessed from all across the world uh, the closing down of offices and the opening up of offices. And we're, we're virtually opened up all of our offices uh, globally. And uh, we're back up at some offices, 100% in London here, we're probably 65, 70% in New York, we're 25 or 30. Um, and, uh, you know, so the numbers have been, have been going back up and it, it's taken us three months. It's been uh, stressful for a lot of people, but, um, you know, the, the bottom line, this will pass. And uh, this is the crisis of the day, but we'll look back at it. Um, and some small things are going to change, but a lot are going back to where they were. And we'll have another crisis in the future, I'm sure, um, that'll be just as bad as this one when you're in the middle of it. So what are those small things that have changed? Because you have a window, literally and figuratively, into how we work. We spend so much of our time at the office. We spend time shopping. You also have a window into that. What are the things that you see that will change in the short to midterm that we should be thinking about? Yeah, so for offices, uh, once we shut down office buildings around the world and people went home, we started thinking, this is three months ago, we started thinking about what is it that we need to do to get those offices back open? And uh, that has included all of the things that you uh, have seen if you're in an office today or you will see when you shortly go back, which is there is more distancing. Elevators are uh, have spacing out. There's more cleaning. Our air is better than uh, what you're breathing in your house because we are um, taking particles out of the air that we never took out before. So all of those things are happening in office buildings today, and they are going to be some of the safest places in the world to be in the future. Um, in, in, in retail, there's no doubt there was this trend that was going on, and the trend was um, online and, and good retail were uh, moving together, and retailers were using them together as one um, space to deliver goods to customers. And uh, that's gonna be accelerated, there's no doubt. Uh, uh, with curbside pickup probably increasing and other things happening. Um, the, the, the trends that were happening are going to continue to um, increase some of them ex exponentially as we come out of this. And it's safe to say, and I know that this is your business, but you're still long office as a way of working. You've talked uh, several times over the past few weeks about 
the power of people being together and, and those sorts of things. I think we're seeing that manifest e even in our social lives. Just help me understand that a little bit. So here's what I would say. Our, our view is that office space, um, after talking to virtually every uh, company that we lease space to, um, that they're bringing their people back. The only, the only reason some are saying we're actually not bringing back everyone right now is they don't have, they don't have enough space to be able to have social distancing while that's important to bring everyone back. So they may be bringing back 50% of the people um, because of that. Uh, but eventually they're going to bring them all back. And I, and I guess the point I would make, and I think this is in our company, but it's in other companies we talk to, the office is about uh, the social interaction of people. It creates a culture in a business. The spontaneity and the collaboration that comes from an office is incredibly important to a business. And you can't create that by video conference. Uh, you can maintain it for a while, and that's what we've all done for a little while. But uh, you really can't do that over the longer term. So offices are going to be incredibly important as they were before. And in fact, today, um, Jason, we're actually leasing greater amounts of space to people than they had before because they want to accommodate all our people and get them back quickly. And, uh, and so they're increasing their footprints versus getting, taking less. And so do you think the nature of cities change? Uh, Bruce, I mean, you know, you're you're heavily invested in New York, London, other big cities around the world, but but you also have an expansive portfolio outside of cities as well, I, I believe. And so, as you think about building out your portfolio, especially around the world, do we live a more? And I'm talking to you from the suburbs, so maybe this is a loaded question. Do we have a more uh, suburban uh, life? Do cities change in their nature a little bit? Look, I think that uh, I don't think that the trend that's been happening for 25 years, which is that people are moving into cities because just like I described for office, mm -hmm. people like to interact socially with other people. We're social animals. And that's been happening for 25 years um, in a significant way. Um, and the trend is that urban cities are growing and growing and growing more. And uh, I don't think that changes at all. And yes, there's, there, will be, there will be the few people that decide I'm going to go somewhere if they have a job that will accommodate that. And that might um, accommodate that. That might be some, but it's going right. to be in the minority. And I think the inexorable transformation of these cities and what's happened is the, these, this has made cities amazing places to live. Uh, the culture, the arts, the restaurants, the, everything that's there. And, and because it started with young people because it was affordable. And it was near the office and it's now become uh, older people because they choose to live there. And I, I don't think right. this changes it at all. Yeah, it's interesting even to I, I was in New York City for the first time uh, this week and in, in several months. And, you know, you do. There's a different feel. And obviously we're not as far back, far along the way back as I think London is in, in many ways. But even contemplating closing down some city streets, outdoor dining, it does feel like what will change is actually the, the type of vibrancy uh, maybe that we have. And certainly you've seen that. I think about Canary Wharf, I think about Brookfield Place down uh, on the lower tip of Manhattan where you are. I mean, you've sort of been, been anticipating this and, and seeing it, you know, even when I think a, a little bit up uh, from Brookfield Place on the west side of New York City, uh, this sort of collision of all these things and, and the, as I said, the vibrancy of the city, uh, it seems to be pretty resilient. Look, we, uh, and some of the reasons why uh, we don't get that um, over uh, excited about the situation that currently goes on is that we've lived through many of these situations before. We lived through the real estate crash of the early 90s. We lived through 87. We lived through 2008. We lived through 9-11. And specifically on 9-11, we had properties, major properties downtown. And everyone told us no one would ever come back to a building. No one would ever come back to lower Manhattan. No one would ever go above six floors. And all of those things were wrong. The real point was that the small nuances, though, around the edges changed some things. So there will be there will be change, but it's 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 nuance change and trends will accelerate. 
um, you know, ESG trends will accelerate out of this and different things like that, renewables. Uh, uh, but, but I think it's around the edges, not the, some of these major things um, that are happening. About renewables, because it feels like we started 2020, which it feels like we started 2020 about 25 years ago, but here we are, it's only June. And it was a moment, it feels like, where corporate, CEOs, investors were starting to galvanize around climate and by virtue of that, renewables. Obviously the world, as we know, has changed a bit, but what is the state of renewable investing? Because I know it's an area you have focused on and how does that play into the short and midterm thinking here? So we've been, a, a, as you noted, we've been a renewables investor for 25 years before renewables was renewables. Uh, we have a major hydro business. We got into wind years ago. Uh, a number of years ago, we started investing into solar. And, and what's happened, and this is the most important point, is um, there are nuanced changes in things that um, are just on a, on a trend. But when technology and manufacturing capacity collides and brings costs down, it can change things dramatically. And what's happened um, uh, in the last three years is that solar in many places of the world has become the lowest cost uh, generator of electricity. And that is a very significant point. You still can't store it. So that doesn't mean that gas plants are going away or that nuclear plants are going away. But um, it's going to the, the solar uh, uh, generation for renewables is going to continue to increase. And that's really what is allowing corporations to now say we will get on the bandwagon of having renewable power. And, and so I think out of this, I think more thought will be put to corporations being responsible uh, in many different ways. And I think renewables will be one of them. And I think you will see the trend accelerate coming out of this uh, coming out of this situation. In addition to that, we need to spend money into infrastructure, get the economies moving. And this is one way you can get the economy moving in a fast uh, and efficient manner. All right, let's talk about infrastructure, because on the political side here in the United States, we hear a lot about it. You hear about it in Europe as well. I feel like we have heard, I mean, it's become a running joke in the United States in political circles of it's infrastructure week, as, as you well know. Meanwhile, the private sector, including yourself, has been especially active in this and especially globally. A huge deal announced just in the last 24 hours, you partnering up, you and I were joking about this earlier with global infrastructure partners, sort of the two big boys coming together to do the biggest deal in infrastructure so far this year. It involves Abu Dhabi. Tell us the significance of that ad hoc deal. Look, I, I uh, the 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 actual transaction was reported, so I won't specifically get into that. But but I'll use it just to segue into um, saying that what what we're doing with ad hoc as a, a group of investors is providing them with capital at a very low cost to be able to outsource infrastructure from their balance sheet. And uh, it's, a, a fa I think, a fantastic transaction for Adnoc, for Abu Dhabi, and for us as investors. But, but um, what, what it also shows is that corporations and governments are going to have and will continue to outsource major amounts of infrastructure and infrastructure spend around the world. And um, the one point I think that's really important here to, is the acceleration is going to increase because corporations have more debt and governments in particular have more debt. And therefore, this is even more important to them because you know, there's only two ways you can um, uh, get revenue into either a government or a corporation is increase sales, um, which may or may not be possible or sell assets. And uh, these are highly saleable assets that can possibly be as well run by, um, uh, for governments, be, be as well run by private industry as uh, they are by governments. So I think that trend will continue to accelerate. So that accelerates in, in a meaningful way over the next six months, year and, and on? 
Yeah, look, I, I'd say uh, the it it always comes in. Um, uh, it starts in different places, and and uh, Adnoc was uh, very forward looking. M- many of the emerging markets have been doing it over years, uh, partly because they didn't have the capital that the rest of us had, uh, meaning the developed economies. But you're going to continue to see outsourcing of infrastructure for the next. Look, I think it's the next 25 years. And uh, it's starting now. That's one transaction, but it's going to increase and continue for literally the next 25 years. And, and, and you can look at the amounts of debt that are piling up in virtually every single country in the world, um, exacerbated by the current situation we're in. And that has to get off the balance sheet. And therefore, infrastructure, uh, less spending because they, uh, we will spend on infrastructure, on new infrastructure or build new infrastructure for them, or outsourcing of infrastructure that they currently own is going to continue uh, increasingly. All right, we got a couple questions coming in from the audience, but before we get to that, uh, I did want to ask you about your own investors. And you know, we've talked about infrastructure, we've talked about renewables, we've talked about sort of the more classical commercial real estate. Institutional investors, they've been a big fan of private capital vehicles uh, for the past Few years, a lot of money has come from pensions, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, etc. You know that better than I do. When they are calling you up, when you're on Zoom calls from dusk till dawn, uh, from dawn till dusk, maybe from dusk till dawn too, you're on all the time. Um, what are they asking for right now? What are they especially interested in that you and the team are doing in terms of new types of vehicles or areas of investment in the short term? Look, the uh, the one thing that's I think important is that it's uh, and this is why offices and uh, going back to offices, it's why they're important. It's why seeing people and in individuals is important. Um, uh, relationships with uh, clients are extremely important, especially in times like this. You don't you can't start up new relationships by Zoom. That is virtually impossible, and uh, and they're so therefore. Um, there's a great advantage to the uh, to the investment managers that currently have large numbers of relationships. Luckily, we're one of those. Um, we're putting to we've been putting money to work uh, slowly into the markets uh, in all of our uh, major strategies for our clients. Um, I, I don't we haven't sensed any um, pullback uh, from that, and I think in fact what's What's really occurring out there is that the fixed income alternative that they had before uh, being bonds or the fixed income uh, investments they had before being bonds have now gone to zero and they have no other alternative than to allocate more of that to to alternative products. Um, So more money will go to alternative credit, uh, more money will go to alternative private equity, real estate infrastructure. In particular, we're seeing money flowing into core core plus products because of the um, of the income that comes off of them as a fixed income uh, supplement. All right. So I want to turn to some audience questions because they're really good. Um, Ferris asks, are you contemplating, contemplating, excuse me, buying retailers who are large tenants of your malls? Is this a plan to save retail real estate in the short term or do you have plans to revitalize brick and mortar over the long term? Look, our, uh, our retail real estate business is uh, twofold. We deliver uh, spaces for retailers to, uh, and they outfit their stores and they uh, rent them from us. And secondly, we're redeveloping many of those centers into other uses um, where we have, because these are amazing pieces of property in the middle of cities. So it's a two uh, phased plan. Our, um, uh, uh, prior to this COVID situation, we had been buying some retailers because what we have is is uh, uh, um, very deep relationships with retailers. We know the ones that are successful because we deliver goods for them. And to the extent that they need capital in this situation and that we can make investments, we think we have greater information than most people. And therefore, the investments we make, we know who to pick and we can make them successful and and uh, and and make a good return off of it. So th- this is an investment opportunity. It's got nothing to do with our uh, retail real estate business because all of the retailers that were good are good will be recapitalized. They 
they may get new owners, meaning debt may get converted into equity, but very few just liquidate. And the ones that do liquidate, those ones probably were going out of business anyway. This will just increase the situation. And that's actually good because it means that we'll get the, the lower quality retailers out of our centers. And when you have great centers, you always have a large amount of space, uh, people to fill those centers. Incidentally, a lot of them from online presence that are opening stores. And, right. and that's this um, collision of, of retail real estate and, uh, and online sales. And uh, yeah. I think you're going to increasingly see. It's an omni-channel world we're living in, Bruce. And presumably, I mean, you know as much or maybe even more sometimes than the retailers themselves about what performs best where. So I, I would imagine, not going overboard, it, you have a competitive advantage there in, in terms of picking winners and losers at retail. You know, look, our whole business is about being value investors into things that we know. And uh, by virtue of our position, um, we know who does well, where they're doing well and what they do. And then we can look at their capital structures and, and put capital in the ones that make sense. The ancillary benefit is it may help out our uh, retail real estate business, but, but the real goal is to make um, money for our clients on the re retailers. And the ones we've done so far have been um, su quite very successful. Uh, one other audience question as we start to wrap up here. Colleen asked, do you see an immediate need for innovative urban design and architecture, or do you think cities primarily either retool their current facilities or make do with what's already in place? Are we going to see sort of an architectural response maybe to the, especially the health crisis that we're living through right now? Look, I, I think uh, great cities uh, transform themselves over time. It takes very long periods of time because these are not simple um, transactions. Usually in, from start to finish in, uh, in a place like London or New York or Shanghai, um, it takes six, eight years to build an office building. By the time you think about when you're going to do it and uh, empty out the tenants, tear it down and build a new one. But what what is important is the, these cities need new space and i think you're going to see an acceleration that people will want to be in high quality spaces which provide best in class of everything and uh and that can be done in new new uh operations not necessarily in old and uh so increasingly i think you're going to see people uh, that there's going to be the uh good and the bad separate even more after this crisis um, uh, in, in all types of real estate. Uh, last audience question, going forward in the energy space, will you continue to build nuclear plants with your Westinghouse unit? Do you see value in new builds uh, as something that you want to deliver clients? So uh, when we bought Westinghouse out of bankruptcy, it had two businesses, a construction business that got itself in trouble, unfortunately, and a servicing business. Um, we did not buy the, the uh, construction business out of bankruptcy. Uh, we own a servicing business and we service um, a large portion of the fleet in the world. And this is an amazing business that has very high sustainability of cash flow um, because you don't turn nuclear um, plants off. In fact, they're an essential service and they ran um, throughout this whole pandemic and cash flows were more or less what we thought they would be um, through the situation. And there's not many businesses um, that can say that as an essential service. The difficulty with nuclear is construction of new facilities. They are, we, we are particip Westinghouse participating in some uh, in the Middle East and in Asia, but it's, uh, it's difficult elsewhere. And I think with um, uh, solar uh, capacity coming in, uh, that will, um, uh, you know, that, that, changes the situation in some markets. But but it's it's possible that new nuclear plants do get built in the future, but it just takes um, time for people to, to, uh, to get there. Well, before I let you get on with your afternoon, I have to ask you, Bruce, um, because you've been doing this for a while. You mentioned at the top of the conversation, you have seen a number of crises. You have managed through this and are continuing to manage to do that. As a leader, as a manager, what's the biggest lesson for you? Look, I, uh, I, I think this uh, 
crisis, the difference in it was that everybody in the world got affected. Normally when there's a financial crisis, it's a bunch of financial people or the senior bankers or people who work at banks that get affected or real estate, it was a real estate crisis or oil and gas, it was an oil and gas crisis. This one affected everyone. And not only did it affect everyone in your company, it affected all their families. Yeah. And the, the most significant thing here what it was and, and is that we need to make sure that people and all their families and all of our employees and their hundreds of thousands that we have are comfortable and are getting back to work and we can help them. And, uh, and that's, that's been different this time than in any other situation because it was, this was very broad based. Every business, every company, every employee in some way was affected. And that normally doesn't happen uh, in a financial or, or, or uh, economic crisis. Well, it's great to see you, even with all these miles between us. Hope to do it again in person before too long. Bruce Flatt, CEO of Brookfield, joining me from London. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining the third day of Invest Global. Yep, yeah, it's been three days we've been doing this. Kind of amazing. Uh, we hope you enjoyed these discussions. Thanks again to all of our speakers. I'd also like to thank CMC Markets, our Europe sponsor, for helping make possible this global event. Well, stay tuned. Day three sessions here in New York, they're gonna start at 1 p.m. local time. You can see all the sessions from across the globe, including my conversation earlier in the week with Steve Schwartzman. It's archived here on our Bloomberg Invest Global Event Hub. And along with recap videos, Bloomberg Intelligence data and resources from our sponsors, they're also available. Follow us at Bloomberg Live on Twitter. Follow me at Jason Kelly News, couldn't help to get in that plug, but get in that plug. LinkedIn also is gonna have all your updates. And be sure to follow our ongoing financial and markets coverage at business, it's a great handle, and on Bloomberg.com. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing at Bloomberg.com slash subscriptions. Have a great afternoon for those of you in Europe, a great rest of your morning for those of you here in the United States. From New York